Thank you for tuning in to Coca Vision, the only vision that matters, because yep. it's Coca's vision. Today I have my brother, the legendary DJ, producer, uh, so many sh things we could title him as, uh, live from the Chapo Tunnel, only on title exclusive. If you want to see this, you can get 90 days free. Subscribe to title. Peace, y'all. Coca. Oh, drug tunnels under the border. Mexican cartels have dug them to funnel their product into our country. Growing up listening to James Brown, I already knew that hip hop element was there before I even knew what hip hop really was. Yeah, yeah, what up, y'all? This is your boy Joe Crack the Dawn. The vision is Coca's. Welcome to Coca Vision exclusively on title. You can subscribe three months free. Today I have a very, very legendary. I don't even think you can say his name without adding legendary to it. Live from the Chapo Tunnel, none other than your DJ's favorite DJ, Kid Capri. Kid! So we crack the boxster. <laughs> what up, what? Capri! What up, what up, what up? Man, Chilling. there's so much history, kid. Thanks for coming to the tunnel. Absolutely, um, thanks for having me. Man, you're like a treasure chest of hip hop. Um, I want to start with, I'm going to tell you where the first time I met you. You think you met me another time. I met you the first time. Rest in peace, my greatest and my best friend ever. He's, he's dead, Tom Montana. We was in a red Jeep in 149th and 3rd Avenue. And you came up to us and you gave us your cassette. And you said, yo, I'm Kid Capri. By where the McDonald's is on 149th and 3rd Avenue. <laughs> you said, yo, I'm Kid Capri. Pump my shit because we had the stupid sound system. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was your way before I knew what a marketing and promotion. That was my way of doing things. I used to walk up to people, yo, take my foot and put it in your car, you're gonna buy everything I have. And that's how I got hot. The radio stations wasn't giving me no job. A lot of people out there was wasn't getting their records heard. So I said, how I'm gonna get be my own radio station. Let me be my own radio station. Let me be my own man. Let me not have nobody MC for me. Let me be on the mic myself. Let me do all this myself. And let me give them the best show they ever see when they come to one of my parties. And that's what it was. And the mixtape made you feel like you was there. So that's why I climbed. So the mix, so now let's be clear. The way I learned hip hop, because I almost said some, something, but I'm going to let you correct it or not. The way I learned hip hop was I was a little kid, maybe eight years old, and my brother would go to the Zulu Nation anniversaries and the battles, and he'd bring back the cassette. Mm -hmm. And I would listen to On... That funk is on. Absolutely. On. Mary, Mary. All the sessions. Why are beats, you yeah. bugging? Mm -hmm. That's how I learned hip hop. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that there was a song called, I don't know if you've been told that Santa Claus is a black man. A black man. <laughs> Crazy. A black man. Yeah. And they be cutting that <laughs> shit up. Yeah. So I guess those were mixtapes. We, I don't call those mixtapes. Those wasn't right? mixtapes. They were. It was more like in the early parts of hip hop. You had Cold Crush. You had Fantastic. You had Flash. You had all these dudes that. In that time, it was a certain amount of breakbeats that was a certain speed that MCs rhymed to all the time. They didn't go beyond that. They didn't go under that speed, and they didn't go outside of these certain records that was all the time that dudes did routines to and everything like that. So these records became official hip hop essential breakbeats. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, as time go by, you know, they drift out. But do like me, I still play these things. You know, I'm still, I still play them on my shows. I still play them on the net. I still play them on my radio show. I hear, uh, when I think of real hip hop, so many different songs, but I remember they used to kill to be real. Did you see me on the net? Going crazy. I mean, we on a podcast. Yeah. No, nah, man, we got to show the podcast, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Listen, hey, man. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. You yeah, see, and, 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 and this is how you show. This is how you can show where real hip hop is at because you just said that, right? And I wanted to put up what a break beat in the cut of a break beat is, and that's what I put. 
to be real. The other day, yesterday, let me see this shit. Hip hop. Who's, who's the first DJ that inspired you? B Ward. A group called Rockwell Incorporated. I was eight years old. Matter of fact, he was. They used the to first. call me Joey Rockwell, but yeah. I guess I meant the name. Eight years old. <laughs> and I remember this kid named Gerald, dude that grew up on our block. He, on the, he got the dice in his hand. He's going, Yes, yes, y'all. To the beat, y'all. And he's throwing the dice against the wall. And I'm looking at him like, What's yes, yes, y'all? It's to the beat. He kept saying, he kept saying, he threw it against the wall. And then um, there was a party in Marble Hill Projects where used to, you get to pay, pay a dollar to go in the community center and B-Ward with DJ. And it was like he was talking to niggas. I used to stand there and watch him. I ain't talk to no girls. I ain't dance. I ain't go to the bathroom. I ain't do nothing. I just watched him. Ran home, saw my mother wanted to be a DJ. She didn't know what I was talking about. She didn't have a lot of money to buy me equipment. So she bought me a mixer that had no headphone hold. And that's how I got better than everybody else because I had to guess all the spots on the records. Mm. And all the bigger dudes that, you know, they had the big headphones and he was doing their thing. They were looking at me like, who's this kid standing on a milk crate doing this kind of magical thing? And it was magical because I'm eight years old. You know, I'm eight, nine Ooh. years old doing this. And these kids are 15, 16 years old looking at me. And it became some girl that, used to, that was in our circle named Olga Carter. She said, Kid Capri sounds like a good name for a DJ. You should try it. Took the name, and a few months later, she was killed and shot by accident. Uh, straight bullet, so I kept the name, took me to the top. B. That's how Man, I went. Man, God bless. Uh, in my hood, it was DJ Supreme, DJ Hutch. Mm -hmm. Hutch, no doubt. DJ Hutch, That's my DJ dude. Supreme, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tricky Vic, mm -hmm. Tip Ski. Tip Ski, yeah. Um, from Forrest, you know, rest in peace, Love Bug Starsky from my hood, too. Absolutely. But he was, he was the super OG, but they would bring out the speakers. And um, yo, every day I try to tell people this, they don't understand, right? This is what's amazing about podcasts for the youth or whoever wasn't really here. Like I'm really getting chills. This is the first time this ever happened to me. But they would set up the speakers in different places, mm -hmm. like as if the cops was looking for them. Like right. they had like stashed parts. <laughs> so Monday they would do it in 23 Park. The next day they'll do it in the blue courts. The next day they do it 146. Nigga, you bringing out 40 speakers, 10,000 niggas is outside. The cops know where you at, right. right? So these guys would bring out the big speakers and they from my building. So I would help them with the crates and stuff like that. But they had, uh, the mother was named Edna, but they used to call her Mother Earth. So she would sit behind the ropes and they'd be like, yo, back up behind the ropes. <laughs> Give Mother Earth some, some room. Give Mother Richard, Earth some back room. The ropes. Yo, Richard. back up behind the ropes. <laughs> no Give Mother Earth some room. Yeah. And uh, that's where I fell in love with hip hop um, from day one. So um, I don't want to I don't want to jump, but I just want people to understand the, signific the significance of Kit Capri. I used to sneak in um, clubs that you DJed in in Miami and New York. And I was sneaking with somebody named DJ Khaled. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't even say what's up to you. <laughs> he would sit up there like you went to Marble Hill. And he would sit in the back and he would just study you. Mm -hmm. This is when he was still a DJ. He wasn't putting out records. We, I don't know if you know that he would go in there and just study you. I don't to, know I that. Used to have Khaled. We used to have Khaled in our room. He used to hang out with us, come stay with us, be in the gym, be in the hotel room. Come to the parties. I used to come to his parties and see him. I remember he was DJing in the club in Miami behind the the, uh, the bar when he was behind the bar. You know yeah, he, 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 he people gotta understand this about Cal is that he ain't somebody that just jumped on the scene. He been working a long, long time. He been grinding a long time. You know, he used to be a trick DJ. You know what I'm saying? If you look at Cal, you won't even think that he did that. You know what I'm saying? Because he's a cheater too. I'll tell you why. Forget it. Because he never really displayed that. You oh, know what yeah, I'm saying? He know in later how to years, do it. but he know how to get he know how to get busy like that. So. You know, he'd been here for a minute and he'd been doing this thing in Miami for a while, so he deserved what he got right now and working. But one he day, did he did watch, you know what I'm saying, the blueprint of what I did. And time, just like I a lot remember of you did something one time. I don't want to say you're the first ever, 
to, uh, you know, was you one of the first to use Serato when they turned into Serato? Negative. Um, Jazzy Jeff was the one that convinced me to use Serato. I was totally against it because I had 15 crates behind me. So when people come to my shows and they see 15 crates and me running through these records and mm -hmm. catching things on time, you know what I'm saying, at the last second, it just looked amazing. And that's how I wanted to look. So I thought if I got on the computer, it would take that away. It would take that, you know, that mystic away. And then I did it. I, we had did Def Comedy Jam, and they asked me to, uh, they, didn't, they, wanted, they didn't want to clear none of the Def Jam records, so they asked me to make beats for the show. So I did beats for the show, and then I put the beats in the Serato, and that's when I first got the feel of it. And then from there on, I put the break. Because I remember one night you was on Serato at this time, and you had mixed some Michael Jackson and something at the same time. Mm -hmm. This blew Khaled's mind. <laughs> like, he was like, you see what he did? Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, what? He was like, he mixed in Michael Jackson with the, that's the new I just Karuna. did Khaled's party in Cali, um, maybe about a month ago. I did his joint, and you know, he was standing there just shaking his head, looking, because, you know, I'm on the road, He's on the road. People on, we all doing what we do. Everybody's doing what they're doing. So we don't really get a chance to see each other's shows and be around each other. So, you know, you see us on the net, whatever, you know what I'm saying? You hear the names and everything, but you don't really get a chance to feel the, the feeling of what's going on at the time. And he got a chance to sit there and see what this is. Me shaking his party, shaking his nah, building down. Yeah, yeah, you're you know crazy. What I'm and, and yeah, that's yeah, what he knows, he knows, uh, he knows exactly well. So now, the mixtape game, I, I believe it was you that really blew that up. Mm -hmm. That's just, am mm -hmm. I correct about Absolutely. this? Mm -hmm. And there was never a, a, a truck, a car, there was nothing that your fucking voice wasn't coming out of. Yeah. Everywhere in Harlem, everywhere in, what, what's the most amazing drug dealer's ball you did, like, where you was like, oh shit, these niggas is in attendance. Cause I've been to so many, you had every killer, every drug dealer, anybody extorter nigga, you did everything. You know, I know I was there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was the craziest one that you sat there and you was like, yo, this shit crazy. I think the most craziest thing, I mean, I done did parties for, parties full of Crips, Bloods, and Mexican gangs all in one spot going bananas. And if you wasn't right on that stage, shit was gonna pop off in there. But, you know, I think, you know, like I've been in a lot of situations, but I think the most craziest situation is when I started getting known with Star Child in the SNS Club because in the SNS Club, you had a bunch of killers, drug dealers, you know, the type of people that you just didn't fuck around with. And at the end of the day, you know, you had to be somebody kind of to be in this spot. You know what I'm saying? And once I got in there, you know, I, I'm just sitting there minding my business looking at what's going on, but I know that this dude right here will kill you. This dude right this here. This is, this, this you know is what whatever. This is, this is, this is 87. Still Dapper Dan. Yeah, yeah. Not really, right? Coming Dapper out Dan, then Rush Rashad came out. Rashad, for, that was on 140. Oh, yeah, he started yeah, yeah, doing yeah. the Dapper Dan joints. Um, rest Malachi. Peace, Malachi. Yeah, Malachi. You know, Malachi. And, yeah, it was around that ever, but in that time, 145th Street was Remember close. the nigga, man? I think he in jail. Remember the nigga? He used to dress up custom all the time. The black dude that every time you seen him, he had like a different outfit. It was fly, gator shit, this, 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 all kinds. A of lot of them motherfuckers. No, but it was a one dude, no matter where you went, if you went to the Olympic, you went to any rest. Man, I can't believe. I don't want to say audio mecca. I don't want to say. Oh, you talking about uh, uh, um, you know what mecca audio. Um, mecca audio. Unique. Unique. Yeah, unique. Yo, yeah. unique. <laughs> no this nigga was fly. Yeah, you had to fly. Yo. Fly. Yo, every and, day. And, and mean with it. Like him, his brother, and mean with it. Yeah. Yo, every day. Every day. Nigga every show day. up. I used to go do parties with Unique in, in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. I used to go down there and Yo, let me tell down. you something, Unique. Yo, them boys, them boys. He was on another level with the fly shit. Mm -hmm. And that was around your, your era when you was doing all that. And um, so I wanted a little bit more detail. I know I've been to plenty shit in the castle. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like you DJ'd the party where, um, I'm not trying to get controversial because I love him, but you was there when Slick Rick got shot, right? You, you Yo, was DJing? Yo, it was crazy. Um, let me tell you the story about that. When that, what really happened, was um, Slick Rick, I don't know if he had an issue with, with these kids, 
but he was going around. Now, the I'm club. gonna just keep it a buck. They was jealous of him. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I Rick was, there, was the I man. I tried to stop it. Yeah, Rick was the man. But I remember what happened was these kids. They wrote him. He was like, "Yo, yo, Rick is bugging such and such." I think Rick was calling, you know, calling them peasants. Or peasants. Whatever, no, them he said that before. I was right. actually at the scene of the crime. And one of them I was, never told Slick Rick or Mandy that, but I was actually. Damn. Yeah, and like, one of the leaders, the leader, I don't know his name. I know, you know. You know, he, yeah, he, you know, he, he was like, you know what I'm saying, kid, like, it's the bug, you know, chill. You know, I was you trying, trying to stop to keep that. it cool that. Yeah, yeah, me too. That's, that's what I'm saying. I was like, yo, it's cool. We're trying to keep it cool here. You know, leave it alone. So he said, all right, fuck, we're going to leave it alone. And then a little bit after, I think Rick had did it again. And that's when it happened. That's when he went outside and they shot shot up. And I think Rick had a girl in the car. Rick the shot back too. He, of course he did. He was a gangster. He, Rick was no punk. You know what I'm saying? And My own eyes. Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. I was standing out there, but he did say peasant before. So, um, uh, so I've been to so many of your parties, right? I remember going to uh, one thing we used to do. Shout out uh, AJ Anthony Johnson from my building. AJ was like the OG, and every year he would throw a, a bus ride mm -hmm. from 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 my projects to King's Dominium. Mm -hmm. And I remember just we all we did was play kick a pre mixtape all the way to King's Dominium, the whole the bus, way. playing yeah. that shit there on the way back. And that's the reason why I got out of it, man, because when I got my first album deal, Starlight, the, the, uh, the publicity lady, she put these magazines in front of me and said, kick a pre, the only human being in the world to make millions of dollars off of street mixtapes, which wasn't the truth. You know, people was buying my mixtapes, selling them, re copying re them, copy them, buying houses, Buying Lambos, for real? it was like that. That shit was crazy, and I wasn't gonna be responsible right. for what everybody else was oh, making. Oh no, because niggas went to jail for that. So I got out of it. And Smart. Took my career a different way. Um, one thing I don't know if everybody knows, but they should know. But the, it's the purpose for the podcast is you as a producer. You a phenomenal producer. Your 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 your, your sample choice. Yeah, like that album was straight fire, B. Uh, which that, one? The second one? The, uh, the soundtrack in the streets? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That album was ridiculous. And then Jay Z went and sampled the shit you sampled. No, Jay Z did the record with me, and then I let him license it on his album. And then I also gave him Hard Knock Life, which Forty Five King produced. But Hard Knock Life was for my album. I gave it to him for his album. And the, it's like that record was on the same album, so I won a Grammy for that. So the Hawk Knight Life, I believe that's the record that catapulted Jay-Z. Yeah, it was the door opener for him, definitely. He sold four million after, after that. Absolutely, I think more than that. I think 45 King something. produced that. 45 King, yeah. And 45 King gave it to me on the plate. And we was on Diddy's tour. And, and I would come and do my first set. I was set up in the middle of the arena. I come do my first set. Then when I come out on the second set, I would play the Hard Knock Life on, with the beat and the, and the hook. And people was running up. Kid, how the hell you get the beat behind them? Because they knew it was Annie. They would ask me how I got it. And then the, the third, fourth show, Jay-Z ran up. Yo, kid, what's that? Put him on the phone with Mark right there. And two weeks later, this shit was hard knock life. Not for nothing. How did they clear that fucking record, right? It was Annie. Uh, Jay had bread, I guess, at that time. Oh, my so, God. <laughs> but yeah, it was big. Yeah, because it's so hard to clear samples. Yeah, I, I wanted Something the same like thing. That? I wanted the same thing. It was a big, big sample. No, but, that's a huge sample. But you know what? Even if they got 100% of the publishing of yeah, that who joint, cares? who cares? You know, um, Mark the 45 King Diamond took me to Mark the 45 King. Um, I talk to him every day, too. Around Flojo, yeah, around yeah. Diamond or Mark the 45? Mark, I talk to Mark every day, but I also talk to Diamond mo a lot, the, but Mark all Mark the, time. the 45 King is probably the first executive I met in the industry. Mm -hmm. Diamond took me to him, man. He was talking about signing me. And uh, we didn't sign with him, but you know, that, that you know, I appreciate him letting me go to his house. He lived downtown. Good guy, off man. Of 43rd Street. Ave. He was on 43rd he was Street, the, the big first high nigga rise. In the Jefferson building. With the big studio yo, in there, yo. with the telephone booth in the yo, studio. Nigga, that nigga, that nigga, that nigga was living. <laughs> yeah, he like, fished you. Nigga, you go to that house? Fish you, yeah, he still I'm doing. like. He still lived there? He, no, he lived, he lived um, across the bridge now. But remember, after he did Hard Knock Life, he did Stan for Eminem. He's the, this the dude that did 900 them. Wah, 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 wah. He, did, he, he produced he, that originally? He produced <laughs> That's not, that's 45K. 
Oh, I thought that, that was like a no. That's forty five. Super King. old. He he's the one that brought out Queen Latifah. I know that. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 he did Latifah, so much. He's the first hip hop yeah. producer to produce Madonna. I'm the second, along with Just Blaze. Absolutely. So like this dude is like, and then he goes away. He goes away, you know, he come out, you know, he out, he stays quiet. I know he has some health issues. Yeah, he had a couple of those. He's getting through that. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I pray for him, man. Yeah, he's getting through that. I pray for him a lot. But he's a know? good, humble, good guy, man. You what? Know what I'm saying? Yeah. And dudes like him, man. dudes like him, there should be setups for people like him, for anybody that, you know what I'm saying, that worked as long as they did. Yo, you, myself, all of us, there should be setups. Because we don't have pensions in where we where we at. No, we ain't got it. You know what I'm saying? We gotta we gotta build ours and make our and make ourselves. Hip hop is, you know. It's fucked up, you know what I'm saying? I call it the natural resource because it came from nothing. It mm -hmm. came from the soil in the Bronx. Right. We from the Bronx, we proud of this shit. Absolutely. Right, when you see McDonald's fries break dancing and, and niggas playing hip hop break beats on Toyota commercials and all that. DJing in the rain and shit nigga like that. DJing in the rain and you be like, yo, my nigga, you be sitting there like, yo, this is crazy, but because it came from, it's a natural resource Real and it shit. made billions and billions of dollars. There should be some type of retirement fund. There should be some type of health care. Yeah. Some type of help for, mm -hmm. for the pioneers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, uh, sometimes they need more than just Yo, what's up, my nigga? Good looking for paving the way. Of course, because that you know these are the dudes that didn't get a chance to see the money, that that you know what I'm in saying. That, that other scene later on. In that chair, mm -hmm. I have to, because Coca Vision is about. Let me tell you, Coca Vision is about preserving the culture, about telling the real history, mm -hmm. because when we die. It's gonna be some fuck niggas out there trying to switch up the history to alter it to their benefit. Whoever their artist is or who their crew is. I see a lot of that shit now. Right now. Right now. Right? So that's why I don't make no money off of Coca Vision. Mm -hmm. I do this straight off of culture mm -hmm. because I realize if we don't tell our history, they're gonna lie and they're gonna change our history. But now we got the videotape. Now we got YouTube. Now we got uh, Title. We got niggas. Nigga, we, we laying it down right yeah, now. You're your own history. television show. You ain't got to wait for no TV show. It's, it's okay. We you got our own television show. Your own television show right? every day. And motherfuckers come in here and they tell a real. So I have to keep it real. And I have to invite Grandmaster Kaz on here. Absolutely. Right? Because you're about the 10th guest. Who said it was the cold crush that influenced them since day one? When, I, when you said they used like cold crush, fantastic, you know, fantastic from my hood. Ruby mm -hmm. D, mm -hmm. the Absolutely. first Latino rapper, mm -hmm. he's from my hood. Yeah, no doubt. It from was crazy Davidson too. Projects. It was dope. You could tell I'm Puerto Rican by the way that I'm speaking. Little ITC and all of them, mm -hmm. they from my projects, right? Not my projects, but across the street. And um, whether it's Primo, whether it's Whoever sat in here yelled cold crush. So I said, you know what? Kaz, my man, I got to call him up and bring him to the, to the tunnel because they influenced too many people in hip hop. They did. You know, and um, so now. Matter of fact, Kaz influenced more than people even know because Kaz wrote the verse for Rap of the Light. <laughs> Yo, let me tell you Is something. that crazy? No, nah, no, nah, let me tell you something. I saw that documentary, right? Mm -hmm. I almost died. Real shit. I felt like a fake nigga going to the hip, hop, hip. I've been doing that my whole life. I always said that's one of the greatest hip hop records in the history. But when I found out a nigga ghostwrite it, and a nigga's not even ghostwrite it, they stole it from, from Cash. Never they, gave him no credit. They went to Nothing. his shows. And they study his rhymes and they said it on, on the Sugar Hill Gang. Well, he wrote it. He wrote Big Bad Hank's verse. Yeah. Kaz wrote that. The, what, what I understood in the documentary, and you could tell me if, if I'm wrong, he didn't even write it. It was his rap. But there wasn't no YouTube or nothing like that. And he used to say it at a show. The niggas went over there and studied his rap and said it on a fucking record. That's what I heard. I gotta see that again. Watch the documentary again. I gotta see that part. When again. I seen that, I almost vomit. 
Uh, Almost <laughs> vomit. I don't know if it's facts, if it's true. There's a documentary out there talking about it's on Netflix. I want my name back, I think it's called or something. Or something the something history like of hip hop or yeah. some shit. Where I was like, no, this cannot be. Like, everything I knew about the birth of hip hop was like, this was crazy. This nigga is really his rap. Yeah. Jazz, Mel, all these dudes, man, they, they, they built it from the ground, but they didn't get the accolades and the money in order. Same to thing, Magic me. Johnson. They made the biggest deal of Magic Johnson back in the days. When he got a million a year, now you got kids making thirty something million a year. It's crazy. The fucking the, the, LeBron James got a billion dollar sneaker deal, but that's off the back of Magic Johnson and Charles Barkley and all the fucking Oscar Robinson and all that. You understand what I'm saying? I feel the same way. So it's yeah. I feel the same way. I feel the same way about the DJ culture. I feel the same way about that. Like. You know, I do 200 shows a year. I've been doing that since 1991, every year. I never understood that, Capri. You yeah, all over the country, all over the world. The first dude in hip hop to own the tour bus, two of them. You know what I'm that saying? That is not, a fact. Not rent them, own them. You know what I'm saying? But then I watch DJs that's getting $150,000 to play music that that is just, you know, it's not... You mean EDM or hip hop? Yeah, I, I'm not dissing EDM or nothing like that, but I'm saying these dudes is getting this type of bread. And they, I, I think it's and, tape too. Yeah, whatever it is, is I just think that it's, you know, and it's dope and everything and there's a market for that music and all that is beautiful, I play it too. But I just think that the harder working DJs like Scratch and Jazzy Jeff and all these dudes, like dudes that really put that work in, that really, you know what I'm saying, did it for all these years. Those are the dudes that deserve those, those numbers. Yeah, you know I'm mean, saying, but the EDM music is so big that those crowds are so big that it really doesn't matter who plays that music. You know what I'm saying? Them crowds is gonna come and see it anyway, so that money is there for that. But the the problem is we don't support ourselves in the way we supposed to support support yeah. ourselves. That's why we gotta wear jewelry. That's why we gotta look a certain way. We gotta drive a certain way and carry ourselves a certain way. When you know a white rock group you go on stage with. Faded jeans, Fucking, fucked uh, up sneakers, a t-shirt, uh, sell the place what's out. What's the shit you wear? What's the shit? That, that long johns, nigga. Yeah, and Vivid. They'll come up in a onesie, my nigga. And Vivid. And make 250000 There it is. He'll be in a fucking onesie. Real shit. But we got to do all the other shit to impress. Just to be rep, rep, rep. Just to be rep. Just to relative. Look, just to be relative and look like you, your ear is to the street. You got to look a certain kind of way. You know what I'm saying? You know, this little thing with the young dudes talking about old this and, and young now, older, like, dog, you think because old, you're older, you're not, you're not in it, you don't know what's going on? You get on your stage with your little record, with your little record, you gotta stand up to a nigga like me on that stage that's gonna shake this building. I'ma play your record better than you perform your record. Now what you gonna do after your record is over? That's the problem. What you gonna do after that record is done? Now you gotta stand up to all this pressure I'ma put on you. But you talking that old shit, you talking this, like, watch your fucking mouth. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, I put a post up the other day, you know what I'm saying? You know, old heads got old bread and will slap the shit out of you. You know what I'm saying? Don't, don't, don't take this, this, this older thing as, a, as like it's a, a bad thing. Like, you're supposed to look at that as a, as a good thing. You're supposed to look at that as that's what I want to be. You know, I've always looked at, I've too. always looked at, successful people, not just old people or older or whatever. I've always looked at successful people as inspiration. Yes, absolutely. I've always looked at it as like, yo, Jay-Z made 500 million, I can make it. Let's go yo, before that. I, James Brown, like dudes like that. Like we looked up to these dudes. Like these are dudes that we didn't say, yo, those are old dudes. You know what I'm saying? Tah. No, we, we looked at, we are like heroes for our heroes. Like so, what you do? Like, like so, what you do? Like, where did we lose that? When the, Cause, when cause the internet I'm came, you know, when the internet today, came today, you're about the fourth person we talked about the shit with because everybody's talking about it, young and old. Yeah, they, everybody's talking about this thing. Everybody's talking about this thing. Like, yo, where, where did it become like cool or to disrespect the legend? And, and, and it's not, and it's also not cool to disrespect the young, but I watch older dudes getting at these young kids that make these records. My man, they not making records for you. 
They make it records for the 17 year old, 18 year old, 19 year old for them. And if you like it as a 50 year old man, a 60 year old man, and you trapping on whatever you're doing, then that's cool. But if you don't like it, why are you worried about what this young, young man's doing that could be out there shooting your family up? This little motherfucker doing what he gotta do to take care of his family. Why I can't be just left like that? You getting on the internet as a grown man arguing with a, a kid. It's like, it just don't look right. And that's why the young people feel that way about the older people because the older people get stuck in the old, in the old school way of thinking and not realize, dog, when you was young, this age, your parents did the same shit you're doing to these kids right now. That's right. So you should know better. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, what do you think? They're going to be positive about it? No, these little niggas going to say what they got to say to make you feel the way they're going to make you feel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Bullshit. Yeah. So, yeah. What, 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 name like two or three records that you officially broke. Records I broke? That you broke. Well, Kick the three first two. It remind me first. Mary J. Blige. Remind me Mary J. Blige. They wasn't going to put Mary out. I uh, called Andre Orell, like, because they asked me to do a strictly business party for the movie. And me. that movie soundtrack, that record was on, and they already put three songs out to that record, to that album. So they were going to dead it. They was going to leave the album. But I was playing Remind Me, and it was the last record on the second side. I was playing that on the radio on BLS. And I told Andre, you need to make this a single. Know me to death. No, no, no. The next day I called him. You need to send me that on a white plate and send that out. I mean, they next thing you know, they put it out, Mary. Bang! So she was one. Does Wu she Tang. know that? Yeah, yes, yeah, she know. Wu Tang was another. I know Wu Tang. Protect your neck? First dude to ever put them on the radio. First dude to ever put Protect Your Neck on the radio. They came in the radio station. I remember it was. Old Dirty, Method, it might have been Old Dirty, uh, Rizza, and Ghostface. I think it was them three. I'm not, I don't remember. But it was them three, they gave, me, they gave it to me on an orange plate. I didn't even know if it had curses on it. Threw the joint on. That was the first time. That's why I mentioned in every album. I mentioned on every cover. That's why when Red, Man, when Red Man and Meth got on the awards, they turned their back to their ass to the crowd and said, thanks for kicking pre for playing my shit. So Wu-Tang was another one. Um, who else? Um, so many, man. Can't really think of. I think I had something to do with, with uh. That's fucking dope. Yeah, I think I had something to do with Low End Theory. Ooh. Tribe, Tribe's so album blowing up. Crazy. Tribe. OPP. Mm -hmm. I, can go, I can go on and on. It's a lot. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. when, when they wasn't playing those records, matter of fact, let's even go further than that. I blew up mine's playing tricks for me. I'm the first dude to play a South record in New York on the radio. That's why the first gold record I ever got, the first go first gold record I ever received before I even received one from a New York artist was from the Ghetto Boys. That I was the first one to play the Southern playing listed Cadillac music from Outcast on the radio before anybody would play it. It's so much. It goes on and on. I remember I was on the block hustling, and I was over there on 182nd and Creston. I was getting money out there. And I remember I was on the block. And uh, God bless the dead, my best friend ever told Montana. He pulled up in the truck and parked it in the middle of the street, like, like not parked right, double, like fucked up. And he was a little bit from me. And he just, he started, yo, God, yo, God, come here, God. Yo, he was so happy, right? He was jumping up and down, he was so happy. And I was like, yo, what's up? Listen to this shit, man. You gotta listen to this shit. <laughs> and the nigga put the volume up and it was doom, 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 doom. Yo. Dun, 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 dun. Yep. Boom, 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 boom. And he was like, my mom playing tricks on me. And you know, we had so much beef back in them days that we just, you know what I'm saying? It, we can relate to the shit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really relate. And that was early on because, like, like I said, like New York was spoiled. New York didn't want to let nobody in. They didn't want to let no South in. They didn't want to let no West Coast and no nothing. We, it was, it was and consolidated that, and that, to and us. That, and that happens to be sort of like the 360, the, 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 the karma. Yeah, this is the reason why they where they at and how strong they are. But see, and th this is why niggas ain't trying to let New York niggas breathe like that. 
but that's or, but or, I, I gotta be real. Like I sound. said, like I said on Ebo, like that's kind of like our fault. That's kind of like New York's fault because you know I feel like New York, you know, we a little bit too cool for ourselves. You know what I'm saying? We don't want to go and do like I took. The South takes the same approach I took. I'm gonna sit on the street corner. I don't give a fuck how many women are driving by laughing like I'm doing bad. I'm gonna sit here and make this twenty dollars a a tape, like you made $20 of crack, but I'm gonna get mine, I'm gonna get $2,000 an hour every time I come out. You gonna drive by laughing, but I'm gonna be all right every hour. So that's hustling, the same approach as long as you take. hurting, as long as you ain't hurting no more, nobody, hustling shouldn't be a pride thing. No, but it's the thing where you should be, they, make your you money. You should be able to work with other people though, and that's what the South do. These dudes are on already, and they still, lifting each other up. They still jump on each other's projects. They still work with each other. The producers, everybody, you know, work in the same room with each other. They, they look out. With us, we get a little bit of something. We get so cocky. New York is, you know, is the key of, uh, we work hard to become the biggest assholes in the world. Exactly. And that's what, and that's what the problem is. It's a fact. Like that's the, what the problem is. But niggas see, want to race to be the biggest asshole. Yeah, but see, that's why, you know, I take my career serious, man. That's why when doing all the West Coast and East Coast beef, I could go to the West Coast and get treated with so much love in the most hoodest places. I didn't get that problem. I didn't get, you know, where a lot of dudes are scared to move out there and, and do shows out there and move around and all that. How big, how big was Def Jam comedy for your career? Extremely. Absolute. That Absolute. put you in everybody's house. That shit put me over the top. To this day, you're still doing shows because of that. That shit put me over the top. I remember the first show, the first concert we did, and it was sold out. Well, all of them were sold out, but the first concert we did, I'm behind the curtain, curtain open, curtain open. People were screaming like I was Michael Jackson, man. And that night is when I realized this is how I got a DJ, because I had a 15 minute set, so I had to play the records quick. And that's what made all the DJs that, you know, play the records quick and, you know, all that, they watch that. But me doing that showed that I could put these people in a frenzy. So when the big artist that ha might have the big, 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 big record, he come on stage in front of 30, 40,000 people and he get on stage and perform this one song, he may do his thing. He could perform that song for a half hour and go crazy. But in a half hour, you know how many songs I could play to make people forget him? And pe oh. put these people in a, in a frenzy that you wouldn't believe. So that's what it was every night with Def Comedy Jam on the road. We had so many shows that we had to start three teams. I had to put Jazzy Jeff on one team, I had to put Jazzy Joyce on another team and put other comedians out. Yeah, it was crazy. Jazzy Joyce was cousins with DJ Chobi Chove. Chove. Chove was from my block. He was from 980. I was real cool with Chove growing up. He also wrote graffiti too. And uh, so I met Jazzy Joyce when I was just a kid. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Since day one, she did a lot for the ladies mm -hmm. in hip hop especially female DJ. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember every time I look at Juice, I see I see Jazzy Jazzy up there and Juice when they when they do the little cameo shit. And she's still moving. Ralph McDaniels, of course. Yeah, of course still she's still moving. I mean, mm -hmm. people don't understand. Do you know I own a store in Washington Heights. It's a sneaker store, clothing store. Actually it's the hottest. It's called Up NYC. I remember buying coats from your first store. Yeah, yeah, the FJ560. I still got my coats. I ain't gonna fight. Listen, listen, complete. <laughs> the listen, FJ560. Listen, listen, FJ560 was a serious I had brand. three of them. People don't know. <laughs> Jay-Z, I know you're watching. It was before the Rock Aware. It was for Sean John. No doubt. <laughs> All right, be clear about that, right? And then, um, but in my store, do you know who's one of my number one customers? Ooh. T La Rock, is it's that yours. Right? <laughs> yeah. T La Rock comes Super every around, week, yep. buy some sneakers, buy a couple of sweatsuits. This nigga T La Rock, it's yours, commentating, mm -hmm. illustrating. He be touring the world. Absolutely. People think like when your shit ain't on the radio all day, nah, you, you done got, died where he's at. You he's got touring fans. the world. You got fans that grow up with you, and you got fans that know about you, and then more than that, you got fans that go on the internet right now. There's kids that might say, why is Kid Capri on Kendrick Lamar's album? Well, you can go to Google and find the reason why Kid Capri got the Kendrick Lamar's why album. Why is Kid Capri on Kendrick Lamar's album? Because he knew that this whole DJ movement and, and the authenticity was where I settled at. You know what I'm saying? He knew that I was the one that put it where I put it. 
and he wanted to show the authenticity of that. Did you did you get along with Ron G? I got along with everybody. You never had no problems with Ron G, right? We had a little issue, but it wasn't it wasn't really me and Ron G. It was me and his man that really had an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think like he came up behind you. Yeah. He's a DJ I always respected. He actually produced We Duggan with me and R. Kelly. He's mm -hmm. the first nigga to give me a hit. Yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I couldn't fucking believe it. Yeah. I had a hit. Yeah. He said, Yo, play the beat, I swear. I was like, come on, Ron. It was G. hot though. Nigga. It was hot. Big. I was in Fordham Road, I played the beat. I was like, oh, I got a hit. Yeah. Without the music, we was jumping up and down. We got a hit. Yeah. Ron G. But the thing I loved about Ron G was uh, I remember going to his house one time and I want to get this right. I remember going to his house to freestyle on his tape and Tupac was coming out and like 15 minutes later, Biggie came in and I was like, yo, this nigga's lit. I was like, Ron G is for, remember he was the youngest in charge, mm -hmm. Ron Jordan. G. Yeah, man. I mean, then you got the Clue, mm -hmm. then you got the MV was like the offspring of Clue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but you, you paved the way for all that. Um, with us, it's different. You know, I come from digging in the crates. I feel like you're digging in the crates. I don't know why, but I really feel that way. I really feel like you're a lost member of the dig. Like you're really digging in the crate. Right. Of course. I've always been in the group. I don't know. I, I was in the media group. But, but I think you're like been there. I've been on all the records. I don't understand. Big like, L, the, the, the Showbiz album. Yo, how did like, we become so close with you, Bronx? That's it. It was Bronx Castle, the Bronx. You know, I, I was dope. Everybody over there was dope. It was, it was just a thing. You know, Castle was really it. We did we, one we formed show in the Castle. We did one show um, together. This is so crazy. And it was me. All right, I invited them today. Everybody, Finesse had to go to London. So they don't want to do it unless, I mean, which is probably never, they're going to never be a digging in the great podcast in Fat Joe's tunnel vision. Because these niggas, we're not gonna get every, I told show your show, we're not gonna get everybody. RJ and Giant live in Japan, fucking Atlanta, Diamond. Like, I'm like, yo, show, we can't get everybody here. We gotta get as much as we can and do it. But one show, I gassed them all up. And we went Central and did Park. the stretch in Barbito. And of course, the honorary member of Digging right in the Crates yeah, no, came with us. That's right. He walked in the park <laughs> with yeah. everybody. I remember Lars Professor was like, yo, B, I, got, I never, I, I knew it was historic, right? I'm going to tell you a story. I knew it was historic that day. I knew it was historic because Lars Professor, he said, yo, I got to get in this pick, B. I got to be in this pick. He was like, I ain't never gonna see all y'all together like that. Yeah, yeah I got that picture me. too. <laughs> it hit me where I was like, oh shit. Real shit. This is historic. Real right? shit. And so we got in the picture and we did it, but it, 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 it was just, it was God's doing. I don't know what it was that you was with us when we did the show, everybody together. Mm -hmm. What's crazy is two days later, my son went to uh, J. Cole's concert in Miami. Mm -hmm. So my son went with Angie Martinez, my wife, and somebody else. So Angie went to see J. Cole after. My son and them went, and then she was like, yo, Fat Joe's son. He was like, man, did you see it? And he was like, my son was like, what? He was like, I was just watching the whole digging in the crates at the Stretch and Barbito <laughs> show. Your father's a legend, right. man. I don't know if you know. <laughs> The, the whole digging was there. Right. <laughs> and my son was like, what? My son don't give a fuck about digging any craze. Right. Wu Tang, that the niggas on. Right. Right. Turning it up. Turning it up. That yeah. nigga don't give a fuck about it. I, man, I almost threw this nigga out the car one time because he didn't know all the members of Wu Tang. Mm -hmm. I almost pulled over on the highway like, nigga. Get the fuck out the car. You'd be like, surprised, man, how many people do it. You would think, because we grew up with them, you would think everybody knows. There's people that don't know shit. You say a name, they don't know the name. They don't know who the person is. I it's a monumental person. Because he rap. I try to tell him, my nigga, you fat Joe, son. I ain't even going to lie to you. 
I spoke to Jay-Z about it. And I told Jay-Z, I said, you know my son rap, man. He's doing that shit, this and this and that. And he said, be very careful, man. Talk to your son. Because Fat Joe's son can't do no bullshit, man. Mm -hmm. You got to come with that pure, my nigga. Mm -hmm. And... and, and, and <laughs> And that's real. Your daughter, my sing, daughter's shaking it. Shaking you got it her up. to perform in um in uh no 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 not pretty Louie. She performed a Callis shit with everybody. Oh yeah yeah she did Callis joint. Hey, pretty, that she was, performed yeah, Philly with us a fab. lot. Yeah yeah had it with fab. She hustled. With yeah, she moved her thing. She moving. No no she hustled. Yeah and she good at what she do. No she and she and, and I'm gonna tell you a story. She respects she respects her position where she at and she respects everybody that you tell you something comes before. I discovered your daughter on Instagram and I was like, yo, this girl is talented. Mm -hmm. She's dope. And then when I asked about her, niggas was like, yo, that's Capri's daughter. I didn't even know she was your daughter. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Right. Yeah. Because I like to just off of her singing the oh, building. Her, not Kid Capri's daughter. Her being dope. Man. You know, if I knew that was your daughter, that I ain't gonna lie, different. I would cheat. Right. I would be like, yo, she's dope. Right. It's Capri's daughter. Like, right. But the fact that she earned my respect as a fan um, before I even knew she was your daughter. And I called you and I told you, I was like, yo, your daughter's fire, man. She's dope. Mm -hmm. So I look for big things with her. Oh, she got to um, do a dope record with Snoop. That's out right now. I it's know that. The oh, video's yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no doubt. Um, the video's actually incredible. Yo, Eve, my oldest you need daughter to sign this nigga man. under you. There's a video director. He shot his daughter's video. This nigga's dead nice. I don't know. He's definitely a young boy or something. What's his name? My daughter edited huh? the video. Picasso. Picasso, yeah. He shot an ill video for his daughter, bro. Yeah, Trust me when I tell you, he's a young up and coming nigga. You know, you Kareem, you gotta sign that nigga. Listen, mm -hmm. so I go like this, boom. I say, all right, Big L, right? What did you do on the Big L album? Did you just produce the song? No, I, I got on the hook. I did the hook on Put It On. Put It On, baby. Yeah, Buck Wild did the, 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 the beat. But I got on the hook. He, he, it that. touches me emotionally. Yeah, me too. You too when you hear that? Absolutely. Every time I play it in the show, it's some crowds time. throw the L's up for him. I remember I did um, Brooklyn, uh, Prospect Park, 10,000 people. Everybody had the L's up when I dropped the record. They, went, they were singing the whole record. It was crazy, man. It was like the record just came out. They loved Big L, man. He had a big, big fan base. He had he never a huge got a fan to base, and he was going to have a bigger fan base. It was about to be crazy. And to this day, with the internet, the kids are going back and they realizing how ill Big L was. Mm -hmm. I get that from my little cousins and all that. They mm -hmm. be like, yo, who you think won? Jay-Z, Big L, the mm -hmm. battle. Yo, I'm like, what the fuck you know about it, nigga? Yeah. You 16. Yeah. Uh. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, um, I'm going to ask you two more questions, and then we do it. These are questions I always ask. Donald Trump. What do I feel about him? Yeah. I feel like he's very dangerous. I feel like, I got mixed feelings. I feel like uh, he's not a punk, but he's very dangerous. And I feel like he's very dangerous because he never was really meant to be a president. And I really don't think that he really wanted to be a president. I think it was a business move for him. And because he got put in that position, he had to go as he go along. If, you mm -hmm. know, for a guy like, Obama to come in and be as clean as he did and represent the people the way he did, if he would have made a morsel of the mistake that Trump did, he would be scrutinized for his whole presidency, probably impeached. So I don't really understand how society is moving right now with this guy. But um, like I said, you know, for a dude to have that much power and to make the decisions that he make, it just seems, it seems dangerous to me. It is dangerous. Uh, Dave Chappelle, one of my favorite comedians. If, yeah, one of my favorite comedians. My brother. Shout out Martin Lawrence. Uh, I love you, Martin. You seen the new Def Comedy Jams? No. What, what happened was I was supposed to go to the Martin Lawrence concert or the comedy in the Barclays last week, but I got sick. I caught the flu. Yeah. 
So I, I gave the tickets back. I wanted to die. I couldn't believe I couldn't see Martin Lawrence. That would have been my first time I seen him live. So I, I, I know he killed the shit. Mm -hmm. But uh, when keeping it real goes wrong, mm -hmm. when did you keep it real and it went wrong? When did I keep it real and it went wrong? You mm -hmm. felt like, yo, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep it real. And it backfired. Oh, well, shit. When you look out for people, when you look out for people and they don't return the favor. Not even return the favor because I don't give the get. But when you, um, when you do certain things, put it this way. When I was nobody, when I didn't have no name, and Red Alert put me in Studio 54, right? That was around, that was the era, you know, when I was in SNS and all that. He put me in Studio 54. To this day, any interview I do, I talk about Red Alert. I talk about Red Alert and the fact that he put me there when he could have got anybody else. Same he thing with Russell. Me. Same thing with Russell. Russell, Love Bug Starsky was Russell's man. That was Russell's man. They came up that. together. Like, that's his man. Yeah. He could have put him in Def Comedy Jam. Love right? Bug was a legend. He could have. He could have put him in Def Comedy. He didn't have to put me there. You know what I'm saying? These things I will never forget. So then when. The controversy on Russell came out, and I seen nobody stepped up. Nobody well, said shit. I went on my Instagram. I went live on my Instagram, and I said, I don't believe it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was the one that stepped up and, and, and said, you know what I'm saying? Look, I, I don't condone a man doing anything to a woman, but you don't make a man guilty before you know the situation. Especially a man who lives such a righteous life. And that's the problem I had with Torrey. Torrey, he was running his mouth on, on, you know what I'm saying, on Vlad or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Talk about Russell, this and Russell that. He's a, you know, I just didn't feel that was right. You know what I'm saying? It just seemed like he was going at the man for his podcast. So I sent a message to Torrey, like, you don't do that shit. You don't make a man guilty. Who the fuck are you? You ain't judge a jury. You know what I'm saying? Who are you to say a man's guilty before a judge and a jury find that out? You know, this sometimes, man, could, this man that gave so many people so many different opportunities and just for it that alone. Justify it don't what justify it, but just, of, right, it doesn't. But I'm I'm willing to say I don't believe it. At least, just at least my let me opinion. find out the truth first before I scrutinize the I don't the believe man. it. That's I my said it. I've argued with niggas I know. I've argued with people and all that. I said, look, all I know the man for is being peaceful, being a nice man. I don't know him behind closed doors with women or nothing like that. So from what I know, he would never do that. Just... Fat Joe's opinion. Right. I could be wrong. I doubt it. No, even if, even if I'm wrong, all right, my shit is this man has then built so many lives for so many people. At least give him the respect of letting the truth come out before you make that man guilty. The judgment. And it made it look like Torrey was trying to get his podcast popping, and that's why he said what he These said. People, let me tell you something, man. We did a podcast, me and Nori, I did the Dream Champs. Me too. And I told a Love funny, it. I told a funny story about um Daddy Yankee coming up. And um how he came he came up in the Bronx we, behind us. But and long story short, right? So I hustled. Jay-Z said he hustled and went to the White House. Uh, 50 Cent says he hustled. Uh, Pitbull, the nicest guy in America, said he hustled. Like everybody. So I said, you know, the nigga used to hustle, right? So this one girl podcasted, she saw that, and she does the reggae tone, and she blew that shit. And mind you, that was one minute of the whole fucking podcast. She blew it up. Fat Joe's ratting. He's over here saying the distance. She blew it out of proportion. Mm -hmm. But I knew that she did that to get herself hot. Mm -hmm. And it was fucked up because the reggae tone niggas that don't really watch these podcasts, they don't even know where it's coming from. Right. So all they hearing in the barbershop is Joe Fat Joe ratted. He said that, that, that uh, Daddy Yankee hustle one. We all said that he ain't getting go to jail. I never said who he hustled for. I never said like, what are you talking about? But the point is, that is a classic case of somebody running with some shit to make them hot. And it's fucked up because and it's, it's fucked look up because you could do you it at any time. You got the two biggest Puerto Ricans. You, you got him, you got me. 
Is that, you know, you could have started some shit. Some real shit, some real, some real shit. Yeah. Yeah. And that's because, you know, the internet is a, a gift and a curse, man. We get a chance to speak our voice, but some people use it in the wrong way. And next thing you know, you know, some shit is out there that, that's, uh, that could scar you. You know what I'm saying? Chicks, everybody trying to come up. You know what I'm saying? You know, people that feel like they got the short end of the stick, now they got a camera they can sit in front of and say whatever the fuck they want to say. <laughs> it's a bunch of weird out Yonka yeah, bitch. Yeah, it's just a bunch, a of, bunch of weird out Yonka bitch. So you got niggas move. out there. Yo, thank you for tuning in to Coca Vision, the only vision that matters because yep. it's Coca's vision. Today I have my brother, the legendary DJ producer. Uh, so many things we could title him as uh, live from the Chapo Tunnel. Only on title exclusive. If you want to see this, you can get 90 days free. Subscribe to title. Peace, y'all.